Welcome to the Adaptive Edge podcast, where we bring the latest research in psychology and neuroscience to improve your everyday life. I'm very excited today to have Carla McLaren with me to discuss everything about emotion, empathy, anxiety, trauma. We're going to get into it deep today. So um, just I'll introduce Carla quickly. Um, So Carla McLaren is an award-winning author, educator, and social science researcher. Her work revalues even the most negative emotions and opens startling new pathways into self-awareness, effective communication, and healthy empathy. She is the founder and CEO of Emotion Dynamics and the developer of the Empathy Academy online learning site. She is the author of Embracing Anxiety, The Language of Emotions, and her newest book, The Power of Emotions at Work, will be released in August this year. So, Carla, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you on the podcast. I cannot wait to get into these topics. Um, I know I've already told you a little bit about how much your work has influenced me, uh, and I use it in my coaching as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Greg. It's so good to be here. So lots to talk about, but first tell me what motivated you to become an emotions researcher? Uh, life. <laughs> life. Um, I write in my books that I experienced pretty, um, pretty extensive childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. And what I realized, I, I, have, I have hyper empathy, but a lot of kids who grew up in trauma develop hyper empathy because basically you're developing hypersensitivity to other people's emotions and intentions. Mm. And so when you're in an unsafe place, that's a really good idea. But because I was so young when I turned it on, I didn't know how to turn it off. And I ended up being hypersensitive and hyper empathic with everything. And so emotions, um, social information, sights, sounds, uh, you know, smells, everything hit me pretty hard and emotions most of all. So for me, studying them was sort of the central theme of my life because I couldn't get away from them. (laughs) They just weren't. And the emotions that were coming to me from the abuser were so confusing and intense and weird and sideways Mm -hmm. that I had to learn how to read all that strangeness. And then the emotions that were coming out of me as a response to having been abused, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, over many years were, they they were very powerful emotions that I experienced as terrible, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't like, oh, look at these helpful emotions trying to protect me. It was like, why are these emotions She's trying to hurt me. Mm. Why am I having nightmares? You know, that sort of thing. And it was my whole kind of psyche and organism trying to heal, but it couldn't uh, because I didn't know what was happening. So yeah, studying the emotions was at first, uh, you know, first and foremost, it was a life-saving. <laughs> it, was, it was in defense uh, yeah. against what, you know, this, this onslaught of emotions I was wow. dealing with. Wow, that's really powerful. And I'm sure many listeners can relate to having trauma and having experienced this hyper emotionality, um, this nervous system reactivity, and um, really powerful that you took that step to, you know, almost as a healing process to to get the master's degree and then continue on and like just go really deep. Um, you know, you've written three books now and, and you're helping thousands of people. So You've written six books. Okay. Yeah, I didn't write them all down because it gets boring after a while. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Okay. Well, I think you've certainly, you know, really made big change and you're changing other people's lives. So we thank you for that. Thank you. So one of the main concepts in the language of emotions is that you have four keys to emotional genius. So I just want to go through those four briefly, and then we can kind of talk back and forth about you know, why you chose these four um, and how you see those impacting people. All right. So the first one is to welcome all of your emotions equally. Uh, The main idea being that there are no negative emotions and no positive emotions. I love that one. (laughs) Um, It's, you know, all emotions bring you intelligence and energy that you need. Number two, understanding emotional nuance. So that means that emotions arise at many different levels of intensity, um, learning how to identify and working with them 
by developing, by increasing your emotional vocabulary. And I know that's something that Lisa Feldman Barrett also talks about a lot. So increasing emotional vocab. Number three, mm -hmm. learn to identify multiple emotions. So this is a big one too, that some people don't realize is that it is normal to have more than one emotion at one time. Um, and just being able to kind of identifying them in tandem or in threes and fours even. Uh, number four is learn how to channel your emotions. So this I love there's a there's a big false, you know, dichotomy that people think they can either express an emotion or just bury it, just repress it, just just suppress it. And, and I love how you have this third option of channeling. So um, let's talk about these four keys. Where do you want to start? Let's start with the place I always start is the um, welcoming all emotions equally. There's no negative emotions and there's no positive emotions. Now people immediately go, well, that's just nonsense because the thing is that the emotions themselves always come to support you and to help you deal with whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any emotional skills and who does, because we didn't learn them, uh, then you're going to take the energy and the intelligence and the intensity of that emotion. If you only know how to express or repress, um, you're either going to explode that emotion onto other people and throw it away, or you're going to repress it and suppress it and shove it back into the psyche. Mm. Neither of which does anything to deal with the fact of why the emotion came forward. Right. So for instance, anger, anger comes forward to help you identify what you value when mm. a boundary has been crossed. Anger is always about boundaries. If you don't know that, um, you may just attack people with your anger, right? You may be like, well, screw you and the horse you came in on and all that stuff. And you'll just be a jerk. Now, if people don't understand what anger is, they will say, well, anger is negative. I know right. it for certain. Right. I have data. Okay. I have the receipts about anger. Um, but if a person knows what they're doing, and this goes into the fourth one, which is how to channel an emotion, mm -hmm. understanding that anger is trying to set boundaries, then you have options to say okay. what, what boundary has just been crossed. And then how do I want to approach this? Do I want to maintain the relationship so I can set it in a gentle way, mm. you know, firm, but gentle. Or if I don't really care about the relationship, I'm like, get out or something like that. But I have choices. <laughs> when I know what I'm doing with my emotions and what's happening, there's no such thing as a negative or a positive one. In fact, if someone has crossed a boundary, I want to see a person's anger coming up. That's the positive emotion at that moment, mm -hmm. right? If happiness comes up, which is one of the supposedly, and someone's crossed a boundary and you're like, yay, fun. What is going on? <laughs> right? Happiness would be a negative emotion in that situation because it's not appropriate. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of these notions of positivity and negativity, as I saw in your book, come from the social acceptance of that emotion. Most times we do have like negative feelings of stress and things, but it's all about, you know, who wants to be sad at a party, right? It's a negative emotion there. And, you know, your partner or your family members, your, your coworkers, if you're too angry, well, that's, they'll, 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 they'll try to get you to avoid that because that's a yeah. negative. It does, it's not social. It's not pro-social, but like you said, imagine a world with no anger, you would not defend yourself you know? Um, and this is one of the things I try to kind of hone in on with some of my clients and myself um, is that it really is a gift. Um, it really is the way to, to get your needs met. And, you know, you talk about channeling that anger. And for me, that's also assertiveness. If you can, mm -hmm. if you can, you know, hone it down to where it is in your boundary, it's channeled, you can now be assertive. Um, mm -hmm. So, I really appreciate that aspect of, of every, every emotion has a gift. And so how can I, how can I go from a place where let's say I'm avoiding these emotions because I've grown up under a culture that says there are negative emotions. How can I learn to, you know, recognize that each emotion is there for a reason, has a gift, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what we find is that we just have to keep, doing it because the messaging and culture from psychology, psychiatry, neurology is a hundred percent 
positive and negative emotions. I know. hundred percent. And everything you'll hear. We have a Facebook group where we bring in memes about emotions and empathy and then tear, tear them up. Right. Nice. <laughs> and, like, and I even have a, um, a little award for the people who brought in the worst message. It's <laughs> called what fresh hell, <laughs> like, what, right. have, what nice. fresh hell have you brought to us? But it is very hard for us to find a meme or messaging around emotions or empathy. That isn't anything more or less than toxic. Mm. So just to understand that the messaging you're getting, the social control mechanisms that are mm. happening around emotions are extensive and continual. They, they will come at you. If you start paying attention, right, you will see, and we call it, well, we don't just call it, but it's valencing. Valencing, if yes. you took chemistry, you'll remember that emotion, not emotions, that electrons are negatively or positively valenced, right? Yes. So it's a way to say this is one thing and this is the other and never the twain shall meet. Right. They don't, they never become each other. And that's what we have learned to do with emotions, which in psychology, psychiatry, and neurology, they call them valence. Right. Yep. So there's negatively valenced and positively valenced emotions. And we say unvalence the emotions. That's the first thing to do, but you will find that you're surrounded everywhere, especially in spiritual teachings. Oh my word. There's such yeah strong valencing and what i've noticed and this is more from my sociology background but when emotions are being valenced social control is happening 100 percent. and so you know you can get a kind of little like unionize the soul uh, to stand up on the table and unionize the soul but just go oh where is the social control right, right. where Who's trying to control me and for what purpose? Exactly. Uh, and then, you know, take uh, ownership of your own emotions again. And um, the sociologist Arlie Hochschild, who's favorite people in the universe, um, calls emotions uh, a sense, like vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and she mm. calls it our most important sense. Because emotions tell us how we feel about what is going on. They also come to support us. And so, for instance, with anger, you talked about pro-sociality. I would say anger is one of the most pro-social emotions there is when people know how to work with it. Mm. As you know, it can be antisocial if people are just jerks. Right. But abusive. Yeah. If people are abusive with their anger and they blow it outward, um, they break their own boundary. And they mm -hmm. break the boundary of the other person. So anger is not being served there at all. That's mm -hmm. like the anti-anger. And if people have seen badly managed anger and they're like, I am never going to do that. And they shove it back into wherever it goes. They also don't set a boundary. Now there's no boundary. The mm -hmm. person who has challenged or offended against them has no information about what they did. So they're going to go forward as a less successful social being because this person refused to have their anger in a, in a healthy and functional way. And that's why I talk so much about channeling to know what anger does, to know what fear does, to know what jealousy does. You can go, Oh, okay. That's what's happening now. And then you can use your skills. But if you don't, and those emotions come up, you're just like kind of a, a kid with firecrackers and matches, right? Yeah. You just, it could be beautiful. You could blow up the cat. You don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> you just, you don't know what you're doing. Yes. So knowing what your emotions are. And I think that's important about knowing the nuance. Mm -hmm. And you talked about Lisa Feldman Barrett. Yep. We have a free um, emotional vocabulary list on my site and it's now in, I think, five languages because people are like, we want to do it in this language. So nice. it's really wonderful. But Lisa Feldman Barrett and her colleagues note that if you just know more words for emotions, that will help you regulate them all by itself. It's the simplest, simplest thing ever. Just learn more words and that you will become more emotionally aware and therefore more emotionally competent. I'm like, yeah. Yes, I love it. I love that she has come out, you know, you're someone who who's come out and kind of challenged a lot of notions, like you said, with psychology, psychiatry, neurology, especially with balancing. Um, and she has as well. And, and I love that, that this is, you know, 
coming out into affective neuroscience, a lot of opposition to her because she's flipping the script on people. Um, but we, is. Yeah, we love her as well. Um, <laughs> this this, this uh, notion that emotions are like a sixth sense or like a sense in themselves um, yeah. and that emotions are always true. Um, yeah. I agree with it 100%. And here's a, here's a quote from your book. Emotions are always true, but that doesn't mean that they're always right or appropriate in each situation. So I have so many, so many things that I could think about and talk about, but do you think that emotions are almost kind of like coming from the body and they're kind of like this subconscious in the subconscious mind that we don't always have access to? And that when yes. we do learn to kind of recognize them more and more, we're kind of getting a deeper awareness of our consciousness. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We're becoming more conscious. We're evolving. We're becoming more aware and more functional. Like we're not a kid with firecrackers and a match anymore. Hmm. We're an actual person <laughs> who doesn't need firecrackers unless it's the 4th of July and <laughs> maybe yeah. not even then. Right. We, we become, um, uh, we befriend our emotions, we become able to embrace and work with them and utilize them as the aspects of genius that they are, mm -hmm. rather than the way they've been taught to us, which is that they are um, primitive. And, you know, our, our ability to think is the best thing. And they go against, um, they go yeah. against logic, they make you irrational. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. this is, and, you know, how, you know, I, I know a lot of people who are very, 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 very smart. And boy, <laughs> a lot of times they can't even get out of their own way. Yeah. You know, they're thinking so much that they're not feeling. They're mm. kind of James Hillman, the hilarious Jungian psychologist, called him rag on a stick. Mm. It's just like a person with no anima, you know, no duende, no, no, no soul. And yes. they're just like, blah, blah, blah. It's just like their body is a thing that carries their head around. You know? Yes. So, so people so overvalue um, logic as separate from emotions. But in fact, emotions underlie all thought, all behavior, <laughs> all ideas. So if you're having logic, there's definitely emotions there. You just may be separated from it. Yes. Right. You just may not know it. So right. how smart are you really? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. The emotions carry the logic that, like you said, they support it. They, they carry the message. So I'm, I, I love everything you're saying here. I'm so, so happy that, uh, that you're spreading this message. <laughs> but I also think that, um, you know, speaking from the male perspective and we do, like you said, we learn about emotions through culture. Unfortunately, these things are not taught in school. Um, I, I, I observed myself and with other males that, you know, certain emotions are just kind of hammered out of you at yeah. a young age, you know, you yeah. don't express this right socially. And then, so you end up learning to repress it, suppress it, and you, they, you just don't experience it then. So yeah. it, you lose access to these emotions. And for males, I think the big one is sadness and, and fear. Those two are probably the biggest and, and um, grief and grief. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, if, if we stick with sadness and grief, then these these are big on change and release, right? And rejuvenation. So how can how can we blame males for not changing if we're telling them not to feel sadness? So Yeah. Yeah, the the gendering of emotions is really fascinating to me. Men can't do um what are the weak emotions, right? Sadness, grief, and fear. And men who feel or display those emotions that we have a word for them and it rhymes with wussy right right we have a name for men who feel normal human emotions mm. and for women they don't get to do anger right and so they don't get to set boundaries they don't get to find what their values are and they don't need to speak their values openly and we have a name for women who use anger and it rhymes with witch right right and so we are told sort of you know, you were saying I didn't learn it in school. And I was like, I learned so much in school from the other kids who were socializing me out of emotional. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they were teaching me how to be a female. Right. And how not to do anger and stuff like that. And I'm sure the boys are being taught how to be boys, not humans, but boys. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
so the the teaching is so insidious like it's everywhere hmm. this teaching of um even see people do it with babies though um they'll see like oh don't cry don't oh don't cry don't cry <laughs> so what message is the baby getting about sadness right right and then there's like there's that smile bad smile what message is the baby getting about happiness yes we the socialization is just so intense and yeah there was um uh like i just wrote a, a um a book about anxiety because i forgot anxiety in the language of emotions it's not in there it's so bad i'm just so embarrassed but <laughs> I did not have anxiety in the way that people explained it. I didn't even know what they were talking about until I read, uh, or I actually heard a, a psychologist named Mary Lamia talking about anxiety as our motivation emotion. I was like, mm. what? And that was back in 2010. And then I was able to like work with anxiety through that time. But the, even though I would consider myself just really very emotionally attuned, I got fooled. I got pulled out of a whole emotion because the way people were talking about it and the way people uh, work with anxiety right. was just foreign to me. I didn't know what they were talking about. So I thought anxiety is just a problem with fear. Mm -hmm. Like you just don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> I was so wrong. I was wrong. Right. Thank yeah. I read I this. Write. Yeah. I read this. I forget if it was a blog post that you had written um, I, that you, that you were fooled, like you said, because it presents itself in its most extreme form many times because people like don't have the intelligence to befriend it earlier and yes. uh it's this emotion once i read your work i uh i was giving multiple presentations last fall and um you know getting really worked up really anxious about it and what did i notice after reading your work was well i'm super energized right now i can yeah. stay I, I might not be able to sleep but i'm yeah. super energized to make this presentation like amazing yeah. so it's this uh emotion that what do you think of what's the word that comes after anxiety most often? It's disorder, right? Anxiety. An, an attack. Or that, yeah. Like you're being attacked by your own emotion. Yeah. Right. And and that's certainly socialization. Mm -hmm. But one of the most interesting things for me is I ask everybody, what's anxiety? And they were all um they were all describing panic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm like, so what's the difference? And anxiety is the emotion that motivates you to get things done. It, you either do things in a task oriented way, which is very, you know, one thing after the other, or you do things in a deadline oriented way, which is where you kind of chill and work in the subconscious up until the deadline. And then you get this big spike of anxiety and you get it all done. Yes. Um, but so anxiety itself can be quite energizing because let's say you've got a ton of tasks to do you got to get on it pal right you need yes. lots of energy and your deadline all of a sudden moved up two days oh hell you got to get on it right your anxiety's got to come up and give you that energy but it that's not panic mm. right that's not an attack and it's not a disorder but if there's any sense of dread or danger in the anxiety panic is there as well and almost okay. everybody who described anxiety to me was describing panic. I, I feel like I can't sleep. I can't function. I'm afraid that I'll fail. I mean, you know, I mean, well, that's some shame too, mm -hmm. but that's why I wrote the anxiety book. And I talked about nine other emotions that work with anxiety because most people can't identify anxiety by itself. Just like I couldn't, I right. didn't even think anxiety was an emotion. I right. thought it was a problem. Right. <laughs> Because I would see people go to panic when they were supposed to be getting things done. I was like, well, that just doesn't even work for you. Right. Right. I, did, I didn't even see it. So, I'm really grateful yeah. that you did find it because you helped, <laughs> you helped me find it too. I used to think, oh God, here it is again. Right. It's this emotion, like you said, with dread. Um, and yeah. it's just, it was revolutionary for me to realize this is actually a friend of mine and it can help yeah. me get things done. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's part of what Lisa Feldman Barrett had found is that once people have a name for their emotions and they can identify what's happening, that regulates it all by itself. It's yes. Like your organism now has a name for, oh, this is anxiety and it does this, mm -hmm. rather than why is my heart beating right. so fast? Why, <laughs> you know, why am I cold and hot at the same time? Like, yeah, it just sort of helps your body 
locate itself in time and space. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. These gifts from our ancestors. Uh, have you looked into the, I know you must have with emotions there from evolutionary psychology, like they, they, they have, we evolved to have emotions, right. To, to serve communicative function. Yeah. Yeah. I, I looked a bit at evolutionary psychology, you know, there's some trouble with evolutionary psychology, but yes. Uh, yeah. You've heard that. Uh, yeah. But I did look at that in terms of jealousy because I couldn't find anything that talked about jealousy as valuable yeah, at all. Okay. It was the green eyed monster and it's, it's sibling envy is one of the seven deadly sins in Catholicism. Right. So I found a book called The Dangerous Passion, and uh, this, what was his name? This uh, David uh, Buss, maybe? David, David Buss, yeah. yeah. And he said that when people have, you know, pathological jealousy, what, what they found in each case was either their mate was cheating on them, they find out later, mm -hmm. so their jealousy wasn't pathological, it was just intense, or there was something within their own psyche that could not allow love in mm. right so their jealousy was like you know we need to we need to have lo a loyal love relationship and the person wasn't able to do it so in either case the jealousy was telling the truth or it was telling the truth yeah exactly right? exactly yeah. if it was intense and maybe it felt uncomfortable but the jealousy was there for a reason. And that was it is, really helpful. It is life changing. It is life changing to look at your emotions as truth tellers and completely change yeah. your relationship. You know, a lot of talk about controlling your emotion or regulating, but it's yeah, that's just, not going to work. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Control your emotions. Like, yeah. Talk to me in 10 years, pal. Yeah. yeah. Because the emotions are, they don't, it's almost like controlling. I don't know. Well, I guess you could. Controlling your thirst and deciding not to drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's just weirdness. Why would you do that? Seems really then, unnatural, but it is yeah. just like that. It is just like that. I love that we're getting into every, all the emotions. I want to tell, I, I want to talk more now that I'm thinking is um, what I'm thinking about now is toxic positivity because I, yeah. I feel that this mindset that there are negative emotions mixed with a little bit of misinterpreted positive psychology just goes straight into toxic positivity. Yeah. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that's been, I mean, when we look at valencing emotions, ones are negative and ones are positive. Certainly it's going to make us incompetent with the negative emotions. Right. You know that I'm saying that with finger quotes, right? Um, but it also makes us incompetent with the positive ones. Because if I tell you an emotion is negative, you're going to avoid it. Right. right? You, I'm not going to have it. You will disown it. So you won't develop any skills except running or pretending. And if I tell you an emotion is positive, you're going to want to go get up in it as much as you possibly can. And to put it on over the top of whatever emotion that is there that from the oh, negative emotions, right? So you end up being abusive toward the positive emotions, like an abusive user, mm -hmm. um, like a, yeah, like, yeah, you're an abuser toward the positive emotions and you're abusive toward the negative emotions too. So I think valencing, and one of the things I say about it is if you think there are positive and negative emotions, you're never going to learn what emotions are or what they do because right. you're going to be in this bizarre, you know, sick relationship with them mm. uh, instead of, seeing them for what they are and working with them. Yeah. Toxic positivity. I just wrote in the workplace book, I talk about a toxic, po toxic positivity bias in the workplace where people will not say what is wrong. Right. They won't even say there's a process here that has broken down. Right. And we need to fix it. They won't even say that mm -hmm. like 85% of, of surveyed uh, workers would not, uh, take a problem upward to management. Hmm. They, they wouldn't avoid because conflict. they knew what would happen. Yeah. They would avoid conflict. They would avoid negative emotions, even when it was like crucial to their workflow and crucial hmm. to the survival of the business. 85% of workers would not, um, would not, it's just okay. So 
this, yeah, the, the positivity bias is really toxic. It's super toxic. I'm so glad you wrote about that in your book. I want to talk more about the new, your new book um, in a second, but just to stick with this, um, this I think is very uniquely American, this, uh, this positivity, this avoidance of conflict, this avoidance yeah. of direct negative feedback. There's lots yeah. of studies that I've talked about it on previous podcasts um, that it's rewarded, right? We want the charismatic yeah. leader. We want everybody to be all good and happy at work. Um, and it's really, really just leads straight to burnout. It's, yeah. uh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it does. Right. And like, if you don't have access, the, the emotions that we think of as negative, there are, I, I put the emotions into four families to make it easier for people to sort of identify the anger family. All of those emotions are negative. The fear family, mm -hmm. fear anxiety, panic, um, jealousy, envy, confusion, all of those emotions are negative. The, the sadness family, sadness, grief, depression, suicidal urge, all of those emotions are negative. So we have the final family, the happiness family, right? So in terms of the families, we've got 25% of emotions that we're willing to feel. And if you remember being graded at school, 50% is an F. Right. So, <laughs> so you have to work so hard to get an F in emotions if you're in the positive, you know, positive bias. Um, but if you count the emotions, there's 17 and three of the positive emotions, happiness, contentment, and joy. Um, you are now working with 17.6% of your emotions. That's just, no. Yeah. That's no. If, if emotions are a funk, you know, a, uh, uh, functional part of your intelligence you want all of them right. you want to be able to work with a hundred percent of your emotions if you want to make it through your life so much hiding goes on you know the culture teaches yeah. us to hide these emotions until yes. we just don't feel them and then we we can't use their gifts Let, let's talk more about this book you wrote I, I we had it on on the tab for the end but um let's get into it because now i'm really curious it's coming out it's coming out in august what's the title it's the power of emotions at work Okay. So I want to hear everything. Tell me, it seems like you did some like ethnographic or you went on site and re and, and interviewed people and, and did, how did you do the research for it? And, and what can people learn from, from this research? I am a workplace consultant. So this is based on the consultations that I've done over the last 20 years. Nice. And also on my education, uh, uh, my first, um, Part of my education was in the sociology of work and occupations. Right. And I also became a, um, a certified human resource administrator and a certified um, a career guidance counselor nice. to help people find the work that was appropriate for them. And I went into HR because I had seen just how miserable the workplace is, just how like absurdly miserable and dysfunctional. Yes. I was like, uh, people are getting paid to come here and have their childhood issues. When does the work get done? <laughs> right? or, um, you do know that this manager isn't functional and these two people are doing most of the work for him, right? Mm. Right. And you do see that no one can go to the boss because she's frightening. And you do, you know, it's like I would go into the workplace. So I've run my own businesses for the last well, since I was 11 years old, I always run my own businesses because I can't put up with the nonsense that the workplace just generates. I just can't. Mm. So going in as a consultant, I'm able to like kind of immediately see what's going on. Um, and a lot of the things that need to be done in the workplace aren't these kind of high level, you know, um, I don't know, workflows, mm -hmm. but do people have privacy? Mm. is this place noisy? Is it too noisy to function for people to function appropriately? Uh, do they have appropriate break time? Can they get away? Um, what is their turnaround time? For instance, if they're doing customer service and somebody is a jerk to them, what are the mechanisms that would help them go away for a little bit? And do you have any mechanisms? And right. people look at me like, what? We don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like they've just been abused at the workplace. What do you have for them? Right. Um, they get 15 minutes every four hours plus a lunch of not 45 minutes. Insanity. Like, nope. Insanity. Nope. 
Yeah. So the workplace is an emotionally extremely abusive place. And part of it is that we, we kick the emotions out of the workplace more than a hundred years ago. Mm. Yeah. How's that working for us? So I looked at the, the overall in mental health effects of the workplace and it is, it's like an emergency level. Yes. Um, it's, the workplace as an entity is just abusive. And so going in and finding how do we make this into an emotionally well-regulated place where actual human beings can live with their normal human emotions. And let's look at the emotions as messengers. Mm. So if I've got an angry, if I've got an angry worker or if I've got an angry group, you know, like marketing is always angry at production. All right, so there are boundaries being crossed here. Not these people all need anger, you know, management stuff. I was like, look, this is a social system. A lot of people don't have sociological training. So they just try to focus on individuals, right? And they're like, well, you need counseling and you need anger management training and you need this instead of saying this person's emotions are responding truthfully to the social system in which they are working. 100%. So why is marketing so angry? (laughs) It is because people are breaking their boundaries. So why are people breaking it? You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at things that have been forbidden in the workplace. You can't talk about emotions in the workplace. Unfortunately. You can't have emotions in the workplace because this is a professional setting. Right. So you need to go take care of your emotions yourself somewhere. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So so the whole thing about the power of emotions at work is not to teach people how to do better emotions, but to look at exactly what their emotions are telling us because it's the truth. Right. And it's not always right because it could be that marketing is hearing things from production that they are translating into marketing language, which doesn't work. Right. Right. So I would go to production and say, how are you, how are you approaching marketing? What is the process through which you approach marketing? And then I walk along with it and I'm like, okay, I'm angry right here. So this is the anger area. So how can we, nobody means to make anybody angry, right? But there's a boundary being crossed here. And then letting everybody know what the emotions are saying Mm. and having everybody involved in creating an emotionally well-regulated social structure so that people can uh, do their best work. And it just... I did research over the the year that I was writing it with all of many people in my DEI licensee and they they work all over the world. They worked in sort of every kind of uh, organization you can imagine. And I was so excited to hear about the wonderful workplaces they had been in. And not a single person had any stories of an entirely healthy workplace, mm. only if they had a manager who protected them. Mm. So the, the book, I was so excited to write it, and it ended up being a book of a tremendous amount of grief and depression uh, because and anger because it's not you can't read it unless you are a hyper empath because I you know I fixed it so it's not just like this whole rawr book but just how desperate the workplace is just oh. how desperate and not a place that humans I wouldn't send my dog to most workplaces. <laughs> My dog would be like, I'm going to get out right away. Yeah, <laughs> like, do you have yeah. a dog door? This is a horrible place to be. Yeah. I'm so glad you're doing that work. And I would love to be a fly on the wall in these seminars. So it sounds like you, in the beginning, maybe working with the whole group, kind of teach that emotions have messages, that emotions yeah. need to be present, that they're always there for a reason. And then you kind of go in and, and get a little deeper into each team and individual level. That's that's fantastic. That's something I would, I would, I've always envisioned doing myself. I work with people one-on-one right now and mm-hmm. I want to run into these workplaces and, and, and I have the same emotions that you're feeling about it because they, people just get beaten down by corporate culture. It's, and they don't even know it after a while. Mm, Cause normal. You know, now. They, yeah. And the people who do know it and who are, you know, still able and capable, they leave. So the right. people who are left are the people who can be abused. And, you know, corporate culture kind of rewards the abusers. Right. Uh, and, and this is something that's got to change. Uh, yeah. I can't, I, 
I'm it's getting hard. angry here. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Anger, depressed, and um, yeah, um, and grief. The, one of the most interesting things I found in the uh, research is the really terrible effects of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, hierarchies are, you know, where the boss is over the managers and the managers over the workers and the workers are, you know, nobody's right. talking to the, to the custodial staff. They're nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And that moving up a hierarchy, even in a healthy person can reduce empathy and hierarchies because they are unnatural and they are um, uh, competition based right. tends to um, attract and support narcissism or uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Yes. Psychopathy yeah. even. Yeah. 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 So people who are transactional in their life mm -hmm. do very well in hierarchies um, and people who have a hard time with empathy and mm -hmm. care for others do very well in hierarchies. So up at the top of hierarchies, you will find 20, 30, 50% of people with narcissism or actual oh, narcissistic yeah. personality disorder. And it only, the disorder itself is only in 1% of the population. Right. So, you know, in the book, I said, it's kind of sweet that we found a place for these damaged people <laughs> to be, you know, to make money <laughs> and have some power and the sense of accomplishment in their lives. But if we didn't mean to create narcissism, mm -hmm. we need to kick that hierarchies need to go. There, yeah. There's just no value to hierarchies. But if you say that to people, they're like, what? How, uh, they can't even think of what it would be not to have managers, you know, line workers, their managers, the managers over them, the boss, the board, the CEO, right? Right. They don't have any even idea about how you would have a flat and egalitarian, right. um, you know, equality-based, justice-based human relationship. With Empowering, open. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. Uh, it seems people would push back. Well, that's, what is that? Socialist? What are, what are you what some, is that? What are you what some type that? of Democrat? I'm feeling some <laughs> negative emotions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's just such a better way to work. It's such a more um, effective and appropriate. And if you make more money that way too, if you need to talk about it's it. True. That way. It's true. It's yeah. true. I know. And that is ultimately what people will care about. And and I'm sure when you're going into these companies, that is what gets you in there, right? That yeah. uh, they, they, they need to know in the end that it will make more money, but it improves efficiency because people are, they're not hiding things anymore. When we're, yeah. we're that's one of the things in my training, um, immunity to change. It's that we waste so much energy on hiding our weaknesses um, yes. and, and, and these quote unquote negative emotions. Yes. It drains your energy. So I'm sure listeners can really relate to that about, you know, how much you really have to hide at work. You know, you can. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how often we have to wait for someone to make, a, um, make an official decision mm -hmm. when everybody knows what should have happened last mm -hmm. week. Right. And it gets this frustration underneath, just like, why do I have to wait for this guy? He's never here. And we could have done this, you know, with both hands tied behind our back. What is going on? Right. People see it. Yeah. You know, it's something about you said hiding. Uh, I talked to an actor who said, you know, acting emotions is hiding emotions, because if you just do emotions straight out, you say, I'm angry. Grr you're a hack actor, right? You're mm. nothing. If most of acting of emotions is hiding the emotions. So you would say, well, I'm not angry. It's your mother who's angry. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you're, you're lying about the emotions. You're moving the emotions off. You're hiding the emotions from yourself and from the other person. So most of our emotion functioning with the negative emotions is how do we hide this? Yes. How it's a we... performance. It's a performance. Yeah. And I love that you brought up acting theater, you know, in the research on identity, your identity is it's all identity performance. And I don't mean yeah. that in, in an inauthentic way, although sometimes, yeah. of course, it can be. But um, it's yeah, really you read Goffman. Yeah, of Irving course. Goffman. I love, yeah, I love yeah, of course. Goffman. You read yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just love his idea that we that we have learned how to enact our we have to, we've learned how to enact our, our gender. Mm -hmm. we've learned how to enact our social class 
our language, our position in the family. Uh, we're such social beings, and especially here in America, where we think we're all individuals, like I did it myself. Um, <laughs> we don't have really a connection to how much a social uh, training and control goes into us being supposed individuals. No, for sure. Right. We are, yeah. the person is inseparable from their environment. Yes. And, uh, okay. So I want to <laughs> give, I want to give listeners, um, some concrete things to take away. Um, you know, the, you, in your book, the language of emotions, you have four exercises that help in building this emotional awareness. You've got grounding, setting boundaries, burning contracts, and then conscious complaining, which I had never really considered that or like heard of that before. And, and I love that. So in the interest of, you know, giving people something that, that they can really, you know, start tonight or tomorrow, um, can we talk a little bit about those? How, how does doing these four exercises help me become more emotionally aware and live more fully in my emotional self? Grounding is really important because it helps people get into their bodies into the present moment because um, working with emotions, as you know, there can be powerful ones, very quiet ones. You have to really have a body awareness to be able to do it. And that's hard in our culture that's been chasing us away from emotions for our right. entire life. So learning to ground, it can take a while. I think it took me a year or so to learn to ground. Um, I have uh, lots of free information on my site and you can just put it grounding in at carlamclaren.com. I also have a YouTube page that's Emotion Dynamics and I have uh, videos of me showing how to ground. Nice. So each of the skills I've, I've showed them on YouTube. Um, uh, conscious complaining, I'm going to the fourth one, is wonderful. And it was for me, as I was dealing with a lot of rage, and uh, part, of the, part of the trick of abusing a child is to take their boundaries away, right? So they have no sense mm. of self. And so I grew up without boundaries, and I had a lot of rage when I was little. And I was very, very fortunate that my family just let me be angry. It was like, it wasn't going to be much they could do about it. So they like, she's the angry one. Um, but as I got older, I got tired of being such, I mean, I was very sarcastic. I would go after people and I was like, this is not right. And so conscious complaining was something I found a version of in a book called Wishcraft by um, Barbara Sher. It's a beautiful book. Um, and she talks about how do you find what you're, job wants to be how do you find what your life wants to be she said what you wish and dream for is what you need so mm -hmm. she's like that's what the book is about but she is a realist and she said you know it's really hard to find what you dream and wish for it's often terrible and so she had something called a gripe session which i turned into conscious complaining and it's right. basically you say here's what's going on um, everything sucks people are no good um and you just say whatever it is and in, or, in that freedom, and there's kind of a ritual kind of container around it, right? You're alone. You'll find within 30 to 60 seconds, you won't need to complain anymore. Mm. You will be in the meat of what's going on. And, you know, you're sort of clearing the air, like, I hate everything. Life sucks. And then you go, because I want life to be this way. And you'll surprise yourself in conscious complaining. You'll be like... I want to live and you're like, I didn't know that it was even there because yeah. you sort of had to move just the everyday crankiness out of the way. So it's a beautiful practice of listening to your emotions. For me, it was crucial because I had so much anger mm -hmm. that which was necessary to rebuild my boundaries, but people, nobody could be around me. Nobody could handle the amount of complaining I could produce. <laughs> so this had to be a private practice at first. And, and, and then, there's no, yeah. there's no shame in talking to yourself either. Right. No. Like this is a huge way to connect with yourself. I know I, I speak with people sometimes and they think that that's, that's for crazy people or, or who does that. Right. But it's yeah. so healthy. It's such a great way to connect. <laughs> yeah. It's really great to speak. Now you mm. can also do it with writing, but I find speaking, you can just really get, you know, and here's another thing, right? No one will listen to you when you're complaining, uh, we also have this conscious complaining with a partner where a person listens to you for three minutes and goes, yeah, mm -hmm, just supports you. 
then you switch places and you support them, but there's no, there's no advice. There's no, nice. oh, you should feel a different way. Oh God. I'm just yeah. complaining with a partner is so great because most of us never get to have our full complaints heard because someone's going to try to fix it. Have you considered? <laughs> no. No, I don't know how to Google. Tell me about this most ridiculous thing that you want right. me to consider. <laughs> Have you thought about going out for a walk? No, tell me more about it's that. It's just the but, validation, right? It's just the yeah. listening and, and being heard. It's just these emotions, uh, they, they need to go out of you, right? In Latin, yeah. it means to move out. Emovere. Yeah. Emovere is what it came to, then emotion in French. And, and now, you know, it means to move out. So it's like, you just got to get them out. They just need to be seen, acknowledged, and um, you can kind of be more in touch. And, and I own emovere.com. <laughs> you do. I'm going to buy it from you. Yes, that was my original website. And all my email comes to emovere. So. <laughs> That's amazing. So why aren't you, it's too dis, too discreet, too abstract. Yeah, people it's like, don't know what it is. People right, know. right. But I kept it for my own personal use. That's amazing. That's so cool. So I interrupted you. You've got um, uh, setting yeah, bound- I'm just yeah. oh, boundaries. Um, setting boundaries. And this is another one that's on um, uh, YouTube is basically you want to get um, in contact with the actual f physical um, dimensions of your personal space. And uh, some people would call it the aura. That's certainly how I first began to see it. But I always knew that the personal space that psychologists identify is the exact same size and shape of the aura. Hmm. Moving away from those metaphysical um, explanations, I also found there's a neurological um, uh, mapping that goes on all the way around you. It's called your proprioceptive space or your yes. proprioception. And your proprioceptors map all the way out to the edge. Any place your hands and arms can go, your body's mapping it. If your proprioception isn't very good, you will, you know, you will like yawn and, and, you know, move your hands out and you'll punch the guy next right. to you if your proprioception isn't very good. Right. So it's becoming more body aware of your proprioception. Mm. And this becomes really important when we look at boundaries, because for many people, their boundaries are their skin. So if someone's going to come at me, you know, with a lot of anxiety or a lot of anger, which is fine, I'm okay with that. But if I don't have boundaries and I'm a hyper empath, which I am, will go into my body and I'll be like, whoops, I, you know, then I have to reset myself. If I have a sense of proprioceptive boundary and space around me, I can have some distance from the emotions of others. Now, for some people, they need to not have so much distance. Their boundaries are too rigid. But getting in touch with your proprioception, you can kind of feel where you're rigid or not. Yeah, um, interesting. And yeah, so that has been really helpful for me, especially dealing with really intense emotions, like the amount of rage that I could produce. And again, as a person who had had their boundaries taken away in childhood, that rage and anger was trying to come and give me boundaries mm -hmm. and I didn't understand it. Mm. I would just attack people with it. That was wow. bullshit. That wow. broke my boundaries and theirs. It just kept it going. But for a while, I, when I finally understood what the rage was trying to do, I would walk around with this sense of personal space and out at the very edge, like, like I would be a yolk inside a big um, eggshell. Mm -hmm. I would set it on fire with the rage. Yeah. Right. So I would set a boundary, but it'd be on fire. So I'd be like the fantastic four, but not with the super stretchy arms. I was the fire person. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so I'd just be going through the day and someone would do something that was a little bit annoying and I would go to rage and I was like, okay, you know, this is not that kind of an evening. So I would just light up my boundary. I'd be on fire and I'd just be like, oh, that's interesting what you said. Like I knew I had the power of rage behind me if I needed to use it. Right. But I wasn't lying about it anymore. And I wasn't attacking the person. Okay. Really yeah. nice. That's powerful. And then burning contracts, the last one. That's a good one for, Grief. it's especially good for shame. Um, okay. What I look at is when we go through our lives, the, the social training we pick up is almost like a contract, especially in the family. 
I'm going to be the funny one. I'm going to be the one who gets the yes. passes. You know, I'm going yes. to be the angry one. I'll be the sad one. I'll be the quiet one. Hundred percent. Yeah. And so in a way, that's a contract we sign. I agree in this social situation that this is who I will be. But as we all know, as we grow up, those get in the way. Yep. And burning contracts is like taking out that agreement we made, actually writing it down on a contract, rolling up the contract and burning it. And I, I do it. this imaginally because what I've noticed about emotions is they speak English or whatever language you speak, but what they really speak is images. Mm. Um, Think of how much more you can say in a painting than you can in a novel. I mean, you got one page on a painting, boom. You can't do that in one page on a novel. Think about how much more you can say with music than with speaking. 100%, yeah. Yeah, so there, there's a richness in the imaginal world that the emotions, uh, it's almost like you're speaking in their language. And so when I put up, you know, I imagine putting a... a a contract out in front of me and I just feel, for instance, the way I have to be as a daughter to my dad. And I'll just, it will just come out of me and my emotions are helping me and I have to be this and I have to be that. And then I imagine rolling it up and my emotions are watching the whole time. I imagine rolling it up, tying it, throwing and burning it with whatever, <laughs> whatever energy I feel. If it's grief, I would, you know, but the next time, what I've noticed is the next time I go and behave that way as my father's daughter, my emotions will be like, didn't you not want to do this? Mm. Right? Like there will be something alive in me that is now aware that things have changed. And I might have to do it again. Because I mean, fathers and daughters, that's a huge, it's really deep. long ranging thing. It's right. very deep. Yeah. but. What I've noticed with burning contracts is that it really does work to sort of wake up the psyche to go, oh, that was the way that we used to be. Mm. It certainly worked then, but it's not working anymore. So what, what could we do Yeah, that, that's more appropriate and authentic to what's going on now? But a lot of people don't even know that, that they even have a choice. Right. Like they're like, well, it's how we've always done it in our family. Hmm. Right, they they're trapped, and I'm sort of like, you need a better lawyer because this is a contract. Totally, you need to you need to rewrite that contract. It's a yeah. social contract. It's a role. It comes yeah. down to an identity, and then people um, think that it's their personality almost. Right? It's just this is how I've always been. I'm the funny yeah. one, like you're saying. I, I'm the funny one, or I'm I'm the quiet one, and I don't speak back. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, or like for me, like I'm the sarcastic, ragey one. And <laughs> yeah. in my late teens, I just went, I can't be this person anymore. Mm. That was kind of where burning contracts came from. Is how do I even become something I don't know? I just know that this doesn't work. Right. Yeah. A lot of identity work. So like I, I do a lot of the similar stuff with the, I kind of help people to realize that this is an identity. Like you're saying, yeah. it's an agreement that you made. However, early on, we can look into your biography, look into yeah. your role in the family um, yeah. and, and just kind of deconstruct that identity. And I love it. Burn the contract. I love the image based stuff too, that you're saying it's really helpful stuff. So I hope that um, everybody listening can take away these four. You got grounding, setting boundaries, conscious complaining and burning contracts. And yes, Carla has spoken extensively about all of this stuff on YouTube. She's written about it on her blog. If this is, you know, if you prefer to read, but um, these are, these are practices that can change your life, you know, starting today, starting tomorrow. And like she said, it, it can take some practice. It's not going to happen yeah. overnight if this is something from childhood, especially. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's often so many reasons that you would keep something going and it's not because you're weak. Uh, what I always say with people is look for the genius. Look for the genius and the gold. Mm. Why did you agree to that? And then when you can find the genius, you're like, well, as a genius, I am now going to do it differently, yeah. right? Instead of, oh, look at my pathetic, sad, you know, desperate life. Yeah. It's hard to make change from patheticness. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. There, there's a reason that we did each of the things we did. And at the time, it was probably the smartest thing we could do. Mm. Yeah. 
I want to talk before we, uh, you know, we're coming up on the end here, but I want to make sure we talk about dissociation um, because it's stuff, it's something that you've written about quite a bit. Um, and I think it's something that people don't even realize that they're doing. They don't even realize that when it happens. So I really wanted to get your perspective on that. Um, wh why do we do it? When does it happen? How can I know that I'm doing it so that I can recognize and maybe, maybe prevent that or overturn a habit? Of dissociating well when I was when I was little and I was being abused I found it was much more comfortable not to be there but I didn't have any choice so mm. I ended up going to this kind of dreamy um, uh, out-of-body experience that a lot of a lot of abuse survivors do they just go someplace else mm. and until it's over and because I learned dissociation so early and I didn't know how I had done it, I didn't know how to turn it off. So I spent most of my childhood and teen years dissociated. I can remember little things. Uh, I learned language, obviously, but sort of like I can remember my third grade teacher and then go for sixth grade one day, you know, like there would be times when I would be fully present and I could remember. Um, so I spent a long time dissociated. That is the, the extreme version of it. Now, you can also dissociate. Have you ever driven someplace and you don't remember turning? You don't remember, like you meant to get off here and your body just goes the other way or something? Mm. That's a form of dissociation too. You go to sort of an automatic pilot. Okay. Um, there's also the dissociation that you may do when um, you just zone out. You can also distract yourself, like say you need to get something done and you're like, well, Netflix is looking awfully good. I'll just watch one. And yes. you know, then it's two days later and you have, you know, watched all 18 episodes, you know, or all 18 seasons. So the thing that I ask about people when they are being distracted, when they're separating is number one, are you feeling apathy? Apathy is a really important emotion that comes kind of down to to put a like a mask over you when your anger cannot yes. or should not speak right so you just go to apathy and that's very healing and very healthy the problem is that apathy if you stay in it for too long can drop into depression mm -hmm. right so if you be very careful with apathy and choose it just say i am apathetic right now and know that you're doing it so bring right. awareness to your apathy yeah, and the other one is confusion, which will drop down when there's too much input and data coming in, when there's too many things to do, there's too many decisions to make. Confusion will just give you a break. And it's really important, um, uh, like a neurological break time. You just need a break. So to not fight with confusion, just be, okay, it's, I'm confused now. I've become an impressionistic painting. I have no edges. I can't make any decisions, and that's okay. Hmm. Um, so to understand why you're distracting, why you're dissociating. Now, dissociating is more of a, of a like it's a psychiatric term right. of actually depersonalizing and de becoming de derealized. Derealization, yeah. Yeah. Um, but for most people, what they do is distraction to keep themselves away from too much input. And for a lot of people, I notice they go to distraction when they're tired and they need to rest. And mm -hmm. we don't have space for rest. I don't know how it is in France. But if you remember the United States, we don't nap here. I know. We don't rest. <laughs> we stay up all the time because we're productive, productive um, automatons. <laughs> yep. Work through lunch. In France, they actually take hour and a half lunch. They'll take a wine with lunch. It's uh, oh. very different and it's really refreshing. I'm a bit worried, actually, when I move back <laughs> that uh, I want to take that with me. I need to create my boundaries, right? <laughs> <laughs> my lunch boundary. Yeah. So I think a lot of times when I see people doing distraction, I'm starting to call it the stop work of the soul, right? There's something, there's some union activity going on in the soul mm. <laughs> that I would then look around at the situation and the environment and say, what is going on that this, that this being does not feel like being here. Right. And okay. is not able to be yeah, I would look at the environment. I would sociologically, I would look yeah. at the environment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's really nice. Appreciate that. So, um, thank you so much 
for coming on. It, it's finally, I get to speak to someone who's just as obsessed with emotion as me. And <laughs> I love that you have emovary.com. Like that is just too funny that you have that domain name. I, I might have to, I might have to try to, you know, purchase that from you someday. Um, so you really, you really dedicated yourself. It's inspirational how, you know, you came from an abusive childhood and, it had a major effect on you and your emotions and then you completely transformed and, and now you're helping other people do. I know you, you helped me at, in an incredible time of distress. So thank you for that. And um, now you're taking on the workplace. So you're going against the grain. And I really hope that these younger generations, um, you know, can have benefit from your work and, and some of the stuff that I'm trying to do as well, that just, just yeah. live with the, live with better emotional intelligence. Right. And um, yeah. And so thank you for that. And I, I do want to have, I have your book here, um, had a big impact on me. And I want to read a couple sentences uh, from there. Um, so one is, if we ignore and repress an emotion, we won't erase its message. We'll just shoot the messenger and interfere with an important natural process. Love that one. Shooting the messenger. It doesn't do any good. Um, and then this one too. Without access to our emotional selves, we grow in this culture like trees in the wrong soil, becoming tall but not strong and old but not mature. So Ooh. both of these quotes really impacted me, especially that second one, because I, we know people like that, right? We, we had a whole presidency about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, we just had... No, you go ahead. And speak that was it. hard to watch empathically and emotionally, that whole situation. I was like, wow. People are so disconnected from their emotions. They don't even know up from down. It's there. It's something that I realized though, is if you don't know how to work your emotions, someone else is going to work them for you. Yeah, very true. You are, you are ripe for manipulation. So true. And that's one of it's the social control aspect. And that's what we talked about from the very beginning. Um, if you think that you can't express an emotion in any situation, you know that there's social control going on. So we covered a lot of topics today yes. and I really appreciate that. And um, Carla McLaren.com empathyacademy.com. Is that right? Empathyacademy.org is the, is the okay. place where you can take courses. And then the, uh, we have the emo You can just look for Carla McLaren on YouTube and you'll find me. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, and I hope you. to have you back on maybe for another round and we'll discuss it. There's so much more that we can talk about. So, but uh, look yeah. out for your new book in the workplace too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Carla. Thank you.